Hey everybody, I hope you're doing well. Welcome back to What's For Dinner. It's almost 3.30 on Wednesday afternoon. Hope you all uh, survived that, well, for those of you in the Midwest, survived all that rain we had this morning. It was a bunch. We had some uh, flash flooding around. Branson got like eight inches or more, so. That's a lot. Yeah, it is. So what do we have going on for dinner here today, hon? Well, I this morning when I, I was off today, so when I got up and got going, I put two corned beef briskets in the crock pot. Okay. And a stick of butter. Yum. So these have been cooking all day? Yeah. Gotcha. Did, and so you put butter in there. Did you put any other kind of seasoning? It comes with a packet of seasoning and, seasoning, and I just use that. Okay. Gotcha. And then what else do we have here? Eggs. Okay. Which in a minute I'm going to stir them and make scrambled, but it makes the yolks intact, and I like that. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're scrambled in my over easy. Got it. And then what's going on here over here? Cabbage. Yeah. Not just your everyday cabbage, mm -hmm. though. Well, and it looks funky because we I put eggs in there just a second ago, so. So we got eggs, bacon, eggs, yep. and um, cabbage, and then you cook it in butter? And onion, yeah, butter and bacon grease. Oh yeah, we have some more leftover bacon grease right here that we tap into whenever we need it. Right. And these are farm fresh eggs that you brought home from the office. Yeah, our awesome nurse Angie brings those to us every week pretty much. Okay, so will any of this stuff that we uh, cooked today and prepared, will any of this cause our blood sugar and or insulin to spike? And, oh no, we have a little technical difficulty with Facebook. Oh, did it go so, out? So, there it is, it's back. We disconnected, but it looks like it's back. Okay. okay, so will any of this stuff that we made today cause our blood sugar and or insulin to spike? And why is that important? Well, why would you care if your insulin spikes? I mean, you just take... Your sugar spikes, you just get insulin, or your sugar spikes, and you just take insulin. Okay, is that what we're supposed to be doing? Yeah, no. So you do not want your sugar spiking. You want your insulin to be nice and low. Um, you know, if you want to on occasion have stuff, sure. It just depends on what kind of addict you are. I am just now feeling much better from indulging June 30th, which was the kids' birthday. So we kind of, that's one of the times during the year we'll indulge, so it's about three times a year. And I'm just now recovering. That's mm. been almost three weeks. Yeah, food addiction is powerful, guys. Don't underestimate it. It's barely even being recognized until just recently. There's a few different people out there who are pioneering that field. Yep. A big thing of addiction in general is, do you continue to do your drug of choice even though it causes harm? Mm. And so, you know, like meth and heroin, those are easy because lives fall apart, families fall apart, people go broke, you, you don't work anymore. But food, is everywhere and if you don't eat something your granny's like why are you not eating this i made it just for you or your auntie's chasing you around the house like i made your certain pie that you like why aren't you eating this if you go to church it's at church if you go to nfl sundays it's there if you go to anything that our society does is is based around food food and alcohol food and alcohol yeah and if you cannot say no to a substance and it causes harm later on which alcohol does it shrinks your brain i'm not saying we never drink but it shrinks your brain and um, it's a depressant and it um, is responsible for about seven different cancers. Um, and then food, as you continue, diabetes, fatty liver, heart disease, high blood pressure, um, anxiety, depression, amputations, that's a problem. I think that's a good point about the alcohol too, That um, or a segue to this point about, about alcohol is that when you have alcohol, and we want to talk about how it stalls fat loss, so that's our goal here is, is, to, is to lose fat. The problem is when you consume alcohol, the only organ in your body that can break down alcohol is the liver. Yes. So your body has a hierarchy, I call it, of the things that it burns, uh, prioritizes burning before the other ones. So at the top of that list is alcohol. So it has to, in other words, when you say hierarchy, you've got alcohol at the top, carbs right below it, yep. and then you have um, fat and protein, okay? Yep. So um, when you're talking about the body utilizing those, and burning them off, it has to it has to clear the alcohol out first. In other words, the liver has to um, has to metabolize the alcohol before you can move on. And you can start tapping into utilizing the carbs. Right. Then you can start tapping into fat reserves. So you're by by consuming alcohol, even if it's just you know a little bit every single night or one every other night or whatnot, then you're really sabotaging your way of eating if you're eating good and you're stalling fat loss. And a lot of people don't realize that. Right, so I always tell people in the office, and everyone's enzymes and metabolism is different, but say you have two to three glasses of wine at night, which a lot of people do, and then you sit down and you have spaghetti, garlic bread, and ice cream at the end, which is all sugar. 
So you're not even going to process through those three glasses of wine through the rest of the night and while you're eating. And maybe in the early morning hours, you'll start to process the sugar of the um, spaghetti and bread and ice cream, but already most likely that's stored to fat. And then you wake up and what happens? If you ate that meal, you're gonna be hungry. So you get up and you have your oatmeal with banana or oatmeal with apples and honey and English muffin and sugar-free jelly, which is all sugar. So you never get a chance if you're eating like that to get to your fat stores to yeah. burn fat. Good point. And one other point I want to bring up too. So going back to the wine, I like to indulge in wine. I love it. And when I do drink wine, I drink the dry farm wine. So it's a low carb or sorry, low sugar yeah. uh, wine. But I recognize that even though it's low sugar, even though it's like um, sponsored at ketogenic uh, uh, events and things like that, like low carb USA, yeah. um, it, it's there's limitations with that. So it still has alcohol in it. And the alcohol is what we need to clear in order to tap in and, and reach the, our potential with regards to fat loss. Right. So just it, for those of you who may be drinking the low carb or low sugar wines, just be aware of that. I mean, it's great that you're not getting the sugar, but but in a way it doesn't matter. Yeah. So it's an indulgence, no and matter what. I typically drink at the low carb USA functions because dry farm wine is com complimentary. Yeah. Um, and then you drink a glass or two of wine every like three weeks to four weeks. Yeah. And while you're drinking, I might have four sips. So I'm not saying we're better than anybody else. I'm just saying, if you talk to people in the health space, doctors that are in this health space, the number one thing they say is alcohol. We have been given a free pass with that. Like it's benign and it, like wheat and fruits, not benign. Yeah. So yeah. Right how much on. time are we at? We're at six, um, seven minutes. Okay. So. And then the other thing with food addiction is you're up against deep pockets. So the food companies back in the 80s, the tobacco company finally got in trouble. First of all, remember we talked about this before and I shared a podcast. Back in the 70s, we got taken off the gold standard. As soon as that happens, inflation goes up. Um, at the time, whoever the president was at this time realized that the American public was gonna get a little aggravated that food was so expensive. So he went to his surgeon general and said, you need to say eggs are bad. I think it was just eggs at that time, right? Well, meat and eggs. Yeah, keep going. Okay, okay. Meat, the nutrition stuff that we've been eating for a long yeah. time. And the Surgeon General was kind of like, well, they're not bad. And he said, we need to fix that. It was an election. A certain president was getting ready to get reelected. And yeah. so he, he pressured his Surgeon General to come up with fake data and fake uh, science that would um, villainize eggs because eggs were getting incredibly expensive. And he was worried about that stymieing his, uh, his reelection uh, potential. So... Uh, yeah, they, they came data, up. They, time, they, they, tale is old this time. Yeah, but what you were, I think, trying to get at, though, is in the 1970s when we came off of the gold standard, uh, the powers that be knew that food was going to start, everything was going to start inflating yeah. in price. So I don't know if you guys have noticed, but since 2020, when we uh, printed, you know, basically since 2020, the money supply of U.S. dollars in circulation has doubled. So in four years, we've uh, we've created 50% uh, of all the money supply that's out there in U.S. dollar terms. So for us, we noticed our grocery bills have quadrupled since 2020. We were paying four times more for our groceries than we were. Yeah. Anyway, how does this all matter? So going back to, again to the 1970s, coming off the gold standard, um, the, the, the individuals in government who were involved in the central bankers knew that this was gonna cause inflation and it was gonna cause food to get very expensive. So they had to start subsidizing uh, food-like products that were cheap and easy to, um, I'm sorry, just cheap and, um, and non-nutritional in value. So the, the good foods have been getting more expensive, while some of the, um, the, bad, the bad foods, think like the corn, the wheat, the soy, um, things like that, the industrial seed, oil, seed oils are getting cheaper. Yeah. Uh, not cheaper, but they're just not going up in price as fast as, right. the, as foods like meats and dairy and whatnot. And if you have a human population on dairy, eggs, and meat, that's a strong population. Yeah. If you have a population on wheat and soy and fruit and sugar, yeah. It's not a very strong population. No, and when the government started, um, they, they around that time too, they got in the, in the food business, they started making those recommendations. So if everybody remembers the food pyramid, mm -hmm. they got involved with creating that with the FDA. They got involved in schools with, um, you know, having health and wellness classes that uh, offered, you know, different, um, they offered the, basically the government recommended uh, foods in, in the schools. Yep. So we started getting all that. And then in the 1980s, the early 80s, we had this thing with uh, alcohol and, I'm sorry, with tobacco. And uh, you know all of these cigarette companies that had all these all of these armies of people who were coming up with all this great advertising and all these great uh, um, all this great information on cigarettes. That they, they had to they had to figure out where to go because it became illegal for them to advertise that tobacco. Yeah. So they did what they, they did what they do. They're incredibly smart and talented people. 
I, I would say that they should have, they're a little bit misguided, but they're smart and they redirected their efforts to, um, to the, the food industry. And specifically, this is the bad part, is specifically when they did that, they targeted young kids. Yep. And so the commercials on Nickelodeon in the mornings, the, the finding the junk food cereals on the bottom shelves in the grocery stores, yep. all that was because they realized if they could create addicts at the age of eight or younger, yes. then those people were gonna be lifelong customers. And so here you go today. We have one of the worst disasters uh, in healthcare with regards to obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, coronary artery disease, all these things. It's funny, I remember when the kids were little, we were in the checkout line at the grocery store and a, a lady in front of us with her kid the kid asked for the Snickers bar that's right there in the checkout line. And she was like, sure. She grabbed it and gave it to him. And my kids, I don't know, they were probably like four or five or six. Their eyes were like, and they looked at me and they said, people actually do that? And I was like, <laughs> yes, because this is where you're really hungry and you're standing and now you have time to, to grab. So, yeah. But anyway, let's talk about food addiction next time so we don't... Yeah, we're at 11 minutes now and it gets hard to upload easily. Go up through. in my feed. I've, I posted the podcast. If you're on YouTube, it's um, Food Fiat is the book. And I'm sure you could find the podcast, you yeah. know. Fiat Food. And oh, then, Fiat uh, food. it was the uh, We Study Billionaires podcast that they did. And they, um, yeah, they interviewed the uh, author. He was an investigative journalist. Had his own really cool story uh, with cancer yes. that led him down as this road. Yeah, yeah, as a youth. So anyway, anyway, guys. Yeah. So anything else? No. Nope. Any closing words? We love you guys. Yeah, we, we are do. your biggest fans. Yes, we do love you guys. And we hope to see you all at church tonight. Yes. And um, yeah, we will, uh, we'll see you guys next time. God bless. Bye. Bye.